Welcome to Bespoken Bones with your host, Parvani Moray, connecting ancestors, sex, magic, and science. Parvani explores transpersonal tools for erotic wellness every new and full moon, engaging educators, healers, spiritual leaders, and scientists in revolutionary dialogue. Get ready to feel good and go deep. This is Bespoken Bones. Hi, and welcome to Bespoken Bones. I'm your host, Pavani Moray, and I'm here today with Dr. Daniel Four, who is a licensed marriage and family therapist and doctor of psychology. He's led ancestral and family healing intensives throughout the United States since 2005, and he's the author of Ancestral Medicine, Rituals for Personal and Family Healing. He is an initiate in the Ifa Orisha tradition of Yoruba speaking West Africa, and has trained with teachers of Mahayana Buddhism, Islamic Sufism, and different indigenous paths, including the older ways of his English, Irish, and German ancestors. He lives in Asheville, North Carolina. For more info on his work, you can look at his website, ancestralmedicine.org. I have been a student of Dr. Four for the last several years and have derived great benefit from working with my ancestors using his ancestral lineage repair method, and I'm excited to be spending some time with him today talking about ancestors and sex and all the ways that that can go right and can go wrong. Hi, Daniel. Hi. So glad to have you here today. Yeah, it's good to be here. Thanks so much. Yeah. So I'm curious if you would speak a little bit about the ways that you experience your ancestors. Like, how do you know that it's them? How do you know that they're real? It's a great question. And I want to preface it by saying that there's no right way to experience the ancestors. But what we have in Western culture is that typically we're not equipped to navigate relationships with beings that don't have a physical body or that are not living humans. And so this capacity for relationship with the other than humans or the other than incarnate kinds of beings is something that requires a bit of reclaiming and um, feeling out and intuition. And in my own case, one way that I have experienced my ancestors and spirit over time is through trance work, uh, work with the drum inspired to some degree by shamanic journeying practices or light forms of trance, um, occasionally with different medicines, but rarely uh, these days. And also through synchronicity, um, meaningful charged events that give me the impression that they're present, sometimes through dream contact, and not saying that all dreams of them are necessarily dreams of contact, but some seem to be. And at this point in my training and practice, I also work with divination from a West African Yoruba perspective, and there are some divination signatures where the ancestors will speak more strongly, and sometimes they're just present. There will be a song that comes on. There'll be a, just a, a feeling that some event that's happening that isn't even, doesn't have a strong emotional charge. It's just what's happening in the moment. There'll be an accompanying feeling that they have a hand in it or that they are just sitting, sitting with me in some way. And having an ancestor shrine that I've tended for well, close to 20 years gives them a seat in my world in a way that encourages that type of interaction. So sometimes I will sit down and make prayers at the altar or, or just when I'm out and about. And that attunement to them is another way in which I experience or feel them to be present. And they're not such strong aspects of my own practice, that, but for some people, different activities that they engage in, like art, other kinds of uh, yeah, creative expression and many kinds of activities being in the natural world etc might be times when they experience a heightened sense of proximity or contact with their own ancestors so that can happen in many different ways and the reclaiming is a part is a function of cultural damage that we need to exert some effort to reclaim our capacity for these other kinds of relationships and yeah so like that Mm, yeah, thank you. I've heard you mention that questioning our relationships with our ancestors, if they're real, is this real, is actually uh, a function of uh, 
cultural disruption. Yeah, I do see it that way. It's a function of, to some degree, colonialism, but just uh, the imposition or incorporation of a way of seeing the world, in my own case, being someone of European lineages that came with Christianity and then um, reductionistic, materialistic kind of scientism um, that negates the reality of other than human beings. And so it's something that's opposite on the spectrum from what I would identify with, is, which is more an animistic worldview. And so many uh, indigenous or animistic or earth-honoring epistemologies or ways of processing knowledge and determining what's legitimate knowledge would allow for someone saying, oh, I had a contact with my grandmother last night in the dreams and she said this. And people would say, okay, well, let's consider it. What did she say? Rather than dismissing it as only a thought or only internal. And so we tend to objectify or invalidate the reality of any other being that isn't a physically incarnate living human. Mm -hmm. And we objectify many living humans for that matter. But once we extend personhood or like uh, legitimate status to the ancestors, then we can start to ask, well, how do we experience them? How do we, how does that communication occur? And so it's, it's cultural damage in two ways because we objectify the ancestors or fail to consider them. And because of that, the pathways for navigating those relationships are in disrepair. And so we need to start by saying the ancestors are a legitimate other being, not only internal to us. And there are legitimate ways to communicate with them. So, yeah, for sure. And it's, it's sad because many people have a direct experience of the ancestors and then invalidate that. It's sad for them. It's sad for the ancestors as well because they're trying to get through and they get dismissed as only thoughts, only imagination, only memories. You are pretty clear that not everyone who dies is an ancestor, and that's um, that differentiation between the well-dead and the unwell-dead is important. And we're going to be talking a little bit about ancestral trauma here in a minute, uh, and it seems like that would be an important consideration. It's critically important. It is a kind of simplistic idealization of the dead to imply that just dying makes you wise and kind. Any tradition that I've ever encountered recognizes a spectrum from more well to less well in spirit among the dead. Most people are familiar with the idea of heaven and hell and can understandably reject the moralistic implications of that. But that's a continuation of much older traditions that recognize people who act in unethical, harmful, confused ways when they drop their body, when the, there's physical death, the soul or the spirit that has been operating from a place of uh, separation and isolation and harmful behavior is going to face uncomfortably some of the consequences of that behavior because you can't, mm, it's harder to stay totally fragmented when there's not a body to reinforce the separation. And many traditions see the dead who are not yet well as a source of real harm and interference and trouble among the living. And I, I see it in that way as well. What's important to emphasize is that the dead change just like us. They can actually change quicker than us. And so those who are not yet well, ideally, we find a way to assist them to become more well when it's our place to do so. At the very least, it's good to have a boundary with the troubled ones. But optimally, we find a way to compassionately assist them to become more at peace, especially when they're our own blood lineage ancestors. Mm -hmm. So, yep. yeah. Thank you. So it sounds like what you're saying is that if there is, if an ancestor or if a, if a person who, when they're alive, experiences trauma and that isn't resolved in their lifetime, that that will get taken with them and, and remain. And I'm just wondering if you'd speak a little bit about what is ancestral trauma and like how do you know if you're carrying it? Sure. I would flip the question to start with to say what isn't ancestral trauma. And by that, I mean by ancestral, I guess what we're saying is there's blood family ancestral and then there's the larger culture. And so there are many beings that we are being influenced by even 
through the use of this technology, which is developed by people, many of whom have passed now. And so the internet is an ancestral blessing, if you will. There's an ancestral um, legacy that we benefit from. And there's all the institutions of sexism and racism and homophobia and all the miserable uh, cultural inheritances are the source of their own kinds of ancestral traumas. And so we, we can speak of it in a more inclusive, poetic, cultural way that frames most things as an intergenerational kind of structure or legacy. And then we can frame it in a more specific, uh, almost epigenetic way to say that we inherit specific body level traumas from the ancestors. And then on top of that, the dead who are not yet well continue to exist as a kind of person or being. And they often enough may continue to be in and around the living. And so there's trauma that is inherited generationally. There's trauma that happened while someone was alive and they've now died. And so that's a trauma legacy from someone who's now an ancestor. And then there's fresh harm that happens when the dead who are not yet well cross the boundaries of the living and draw on the energy of the living, which is its own chronic, often unconscious or unrecognized boundary violation. And that can occasionally be sexual in nature or in tone. That's recognized in traditions like the incubus or succubus in the unhelpful, harmful aspects of those traditions or things like that. The dead who are not yet well can be clingy and pushy and just unhelpful in the way that they relate with us. So yeah, those are a few different ways in which unhelpful legacy comes to us from the ancestors. Let me say just that much and let you refocus it. Yeah, thank you. I mean, what comes to me is that if culturally we're really not aware of our ancestors so much and we're not engaging with them, that it might feel really like any ancestral trauma I'm carrying is mine, right? I might not be able to tell Mm -hmm. what's not mine. And could you speak to that a little bit? Sure. We tend in Western culture, there are many blessings that come from the intense individualism. There's a kind of sovereignty or confidence that can contribute to getting a lot of things done. But the one of the shadow sides of that is that we frame our mental, emotional experience as a, personal. And the the things that I struggle with are personal. They're my limitations. They're my problems. And in the last 10, 15 years of supporting people in ancestor work, I've seen repeatedly that there's a quality of relief that comes when people see that what they're struggling with is actually an intergenerational, often family inherited burden or legacy or just karmic trajectory or pattern that didn't start with them. And it's a relief because it doesn't mean that they need to add this extra layer that they're suffering and they're a loser because they're suffering, that it's a commentary on their character or their abilities or something. And it also allows for a framework to call in collective level blessings and medicine. Because if you frame a, a big systemic collective level cultural problem as only personal, you're going to... Uh, have a hard time shifting it because it's a it's a bigger energy than you, and so it's like that with many of the cultural toxins like racism, sexism, etc., colonialism. That if you see the legacies of those things as only personal, reinforcing a view of yourself that's too isolated, it's a distorted view of self that fails to see the roots and the cultural interconnections. When we start to reframe ourselves as a convergence of many different energies, including ancestral lineages, we soften the judgment we have toward ourselves about what we're struggling with, which is good. And we actually create like psychological, psychic pathways for the blessings of those older lineages and systems that we're made of to start to reach us more. And that's medicine, that's healing, that's antidote for the ways that we're living in a culture that still has a lot of toxicity and a lot of trouble. So it sounds like um, when we look at the bigger picture things of homophobia, racism, transphobia, sexism, all of misogyny, hegemony, all of those things, 
um, that what we are dealing with is a legacy of ancestral trauma. Absolutely. That's how I see it. And I've seen in the work that I've done with others, I, there are many people, for example, uh, women and men uh, who have never experienced directly uh, a, the energy of a kind, supportive, uh, earth-connected feminine, like women, woman or uh, aspect of the sacred feminine. And so when, for example, people are tapping into their own ancestral lineages and finding that blessing in their own lineages, for one, working with blood ancestors comes with an implicit permission to sink into that relationship. It's like, oh, these are my ancestors. I'm not connecting with some other culture. I'm not connecting with some deity that I wasn't raised with. These are my own ancestors. And when people's recent living family has been a source of such uh, disappointment or overt trauma or harm, to see that one's own blood ancestors carry an um, energy of the embodied, let's say, sacred feminine in a thousand and one different forms, that is a can be a paradigm shift for people to let in the blessings of the grandmothers. And it's an antidote that starts to transform internally some of the cultural wounding from sexism, misogyny, patriarchy, violence toward women. And similarly, seeing people who are non-heterosexual recognize that some of the, not only is there acceptance from older ancestors about being not heterosexual, that their sexual orientation may be an inherited gift, a blessing that is where the ancestors not only accept, but they are delighted to see that blessing of difference and diversity be consciously continuing and be reestablished in the lineage. And so that kind of witnessing and mirroring and acceptance from the larger family structure can shift the unhelpful aspects of like an outsider experience. Similar with folks who are trans or queer or not identifying with or feeling well met by the binary and seeing the gender diversity and the full spectrum of many different ways of working with polarity and gender and all of it in their own blood lineages is a blessing and is a, can be a sense of Instead of standing outside the circle of family, because uh, recent culture and family can come with a lot of judgments, suddenly by being in relationship with very sex positive, queer friendly, etc. ancestors, there's a sense of standing in the center of the circle. Like they are reinstituting, reestablishing family blood blessings in the present in a way that brings great happiness to the ancestors. So that can be a real, um, a real shift for people sometimes. Mm -hmm. Recreating that sense of I belong. Yeah, absolutely. I want to shift into talking a little bit more explicitly about sexuality. And I was remembering that when I first met you, I came to you and I said, oh, I want to do this ritual where I generate a bunch of erotic energy and offer it to the ancestors. And you were kind of like, all right, hold the phone here, Pavani. Let's let's talk about this. Um, <laughs> and you were you were you had some sage advice and, and wisdom and slid me down and put some cautionary notes in place. And I'm just curious if you'd speak a little bit about what can get tangled up in terms of uh, ancestors and sexuality. Sure. The main distinction with communing with the ancestors, whether it's offerings of erotic energy, food, drink incense, any kind of offering that has its own energetic signature and tone and quality to it, is you want to make sure that you're not grouping the ancestors into one monolithic category any more than you would say, I'm going to make an offering to the humans and just go out on the street and say, hey, humans, I want to share some erotic energy with you. People would be like, whoa, what's going on? And so the, the first distinction is to make sure that the ones that you are ritually feeding are clearly the loving, wise, well ancestors and not the ghosts. So among all those who have lived and died and continue in spirit to be available for relationship, it's my bias that you want 
most of the time, unless you're intentionally feeding the ghosts, which is a different ritual process, uh, to be very clear that you're calling in and sharing whatever offering it is only with the wise and loving well-off ancestors. And so that's one just note of uh, discernment, not even necessarily caution, just discernment. Another is making sure that any given offering, whether it be erotic energy or beer or a candle, is what they want. Some, like any human, some ancestors are going to be into certain things and not into other things. And uh, it's my own personal experience and it resonates with what I've stepped others through is that sometimes people find that one lineage or another is very inclined to relate in a way that includes the play of erotic energy and offerings in that way. And some other lineages may present in a different way that isn't so much about that. And so it's important to make sure that you're inviting the ones who wish for that type of communion. And yeah, so those are my two thoughts around the specific offering of erotic energies. In terms of the kinds of things that can get tangled up around sexuality and ancestry, um, there's so many things really. As we've discussed, one taboo that comes up for people is, and when we were talking about blood ancestors, people associate the blood with family, understandably. And family, there's a clear and relevant taboo around sexual exchange with family members. And yet we come into the world through the blessing of our family having sex. And so the that can get charged in, in a way that if it can cause people's um, past trauma, if there is past trauma, to be lit up in a way. As I was sharing with you, uh, recently, as, a, as an example, I, I had a sexual dream of my grandmother, which I don't tend to have that often. And in, initially, I'm like, wow, that's many people, if they heard that, would be like, whoa, that's creepy or, you know, whatever. It wasn't creepy in the dream. And part of what I was speaking about before sleep is how, is about the Celtic goddess Maeve. And my grandma Howell's lineage includes Irish ancestors. And what happens when the whole lineage is well? is the most recent ancestor on that lineage can function as a face of a big collective energy. And so the stories of the Celtic goddess Maeve include testing young men who would become leaders uh, and by presenting in the old hag form and to see if the young man can see through the outer appearance of that, to see the uh, vibrant eroticism of the land and the goddess that's able to take many forms. And so the ancestors, especially once they've passed, can become a collective archetypal deity configuration of energy. And erotic exchange and embodiment of that kind of energy can be just lovely, fantastic. And if you don't have a framework for it, you can get weirded out by having a sex dream of your grandmother. (laughs) <laughs> for sure i'm curious in you know, you've worked with hundreds and hundreds of folks helping them connect with their older ancestral guides and i'm curious if in all of that you've noticed trends or patterns on how your clients have characterized the erotic throughout their their work with their ancestors sure one theme across the board is that the older pre-colonialism, I'm generalizing here, so ancestors speaking as someone of European blood from before the last 2,000 years, and timelines vary depending on where your people are from. But let's say an earlier cultural strata of ancestors 2,000 plus years, years back tend to have a less compartmentalized experience of sex or the erotic as different from everyday life. It's similar when the older ones are asked about what's your experience of the sacred? What's your experience of spirituality? They're kind of like, what do you mean? As opposed to what? So when asked, what's your experience of erotic life force energy, sexuality? The answer often comes back as opposed to what? How do you mean? 
Like, why, why are you asking me about this thing as if it's somehow separate from any other aspect of life? Or they'll often point to the natural world and just be like, everything's kind of lit up and magical and full of life and communing. And what's the concern and what's the problem? Another thing that is true is that our ancestors, by and large, have been living in groups of 20 to 200 people for a lot of our history. And in situations like that, there's intense accountability and intimacy. And so people are sharing, because people need to coexist with one another, the harms that could happen around sexual misconduct or acting out are going to be dealt with more proactively and in a way that preserves family and community and is not is more about weaving people in instead of ostracizing and exiling and shaming people. And so there tends to be lower levels of shaming and repression and acting out. And when there is that type of behavior, there's a sense that it's handled in a way that preserves community. And look, this is not to idealize tribal indigenous peoples or to say that it's not to idealize the past, but when people live in a close-knit community, there, the structures for accountability and increased safety are necessarily in place. I have found that when folks who resonate with different kinds of non-monogamy, polyamory, non-traditional relationship structures, bring that inquiry to the older ancestors, the older ancestors tend to be like, yeah, of course, what, like we get it. And so it tends to be a familiar, like, why would you do it any way other than that kind of response from them, which is consistent with the, you know, the book Sex at Dawn is uh, explores some of this terrain about uh, the prehistory of human sexuality. And, and so the visioning work that I've supported others through seems to fit with that, with the conclusions those authors are making. and. Most of the time, the living people who I've supported who bring the question of sexuality or sexual energy to the older ancestral guides, it's the living person who has their perception stretched about it. And it's sometimes a stretch for spiritual practitioner or seeker people to allow for erotic energy to be part of their experience of the sacred because there's such a strong tendency to split those two in modern times and the ancestors are like what's going on why do you split this we don't split this off and and sometimes the ancestors present to people in an explicitly erotic way and people are sometimes hesitant to share about that or they don't know how to process it because it touches on the family family doesn't equal sex taboo mm -hmm. but it sounds like there is a, a strong way that the ancestors can support the development of sexual wellness by really presenting a different paradigm of integrated eroticism. Yeah, absolutely. They can support sexual wellness in a number of different ways. One is bringing a different cultural paradigm is an antidote or medicine for sexism and patriarchy and by reestablishing really healthy and diverse expressions of sacred masculine feminine and non-binary non-gendered energies and they can help living people who are not heterosexual to see not only acceptance but to start to unpackage some of the specific gifts and and frankly spiritual responsibilities that come with that diverse uh, that orientation, or it's a blessing of difference that comes with, in many cultures, sacred responsibilities. And they can help people who are trans or queer or, uh, and it's not to imply that everyone holds that in the same way, but people who question and operate outside or creatively within a very binary system to know how to navigate those blessings that there's, again, specific blessings and gifts and capacities that come from 
from that. There's a, there's a natural association of people who are operating outside or uh, different than that cultural binary to assume that it means they can operate in the physical world and the spirit world w- with greater ease than people who haven't questioned those structures. And the ancestors are like, yeah, sure, let us help you know how to do that. And same with sex positivity. The ancestors don't, in my experience, the older well ancestors from what I've seen, not only are they non-judgmental about that, they have a very non-compartmentalized experience of the erotic. And so helping their living descendants to embody that, it's great. And they know how to bring babies if you want babies. They, at least in Yoruba tradition, are very associated with the blessing of fertility because it's the ancestors who return when we have children. And they know how to harness the life force energy in a way that's not focused on making human children, but is on manifesting all kinds of creative expressions of what we're here to do, of our destiny. And it's important to say that because people would tend to not go to the ancestors for support around sexuality and erotic energy. And it's a failure to engage a really vital resource. They get it. Uh, They can help with that. You know, one of the learnings that I've really taken away from our work together is that these relationships with our ancestors are reciprocal and that they can support us and we can support them. And when we're talking about the um, the legacy of, of trauma through misogyny, sexism, homophobia, all the things that relate to the body and to the erotic. You know, those of us who exist in marginalized communities like queer community or trans community are really dealing with a lot of, of that legacy, right? And mm-hmm. in terms of that reciprocal relationship, my sense, and I'm curious of your take on it, is that my developing my sexual wellness is a blessing for them. And that as we, the living, practice erotic wellness, practice uh, consent, practice uh, negotiation, practice um, embodiment, practice pleasure in ways that are um, really nourishing for us, that that also, that those ripples echo back through time and can be a blessing to heal some of those wounds of, of like, let's say HIV or homophobia, that that can um, assuage some of that trauma. And I'm curious if you could just speak to that for a minute. Yeah, it's great. I see it that way too. Uh, one of the common things I encounter is European ancestored Americans coming to the work with the view that my ancestors suck. They're really just not commendable people. And there's an un, it's understandable like some people are like my ancestors are judgy fundamentalist heteronormative former slave owning super judgy don't want to be around them people why would i move in that direction as a source of wellness that's understandable and yet one of the most potent acts of cultural healing is to not allow the recent generations, which can include 500, 1,000, 1,500 years, to fully define who we are ancestrally. And I feel strongly that even the most like radical, queer, progressively cultural healing, awesome person can find mirroring and backing in their own older ancestral lineages for the work they're doing, for who they are. And, and so when we see the blessings that are part of our older lineages, it's a body level healing. Otherwise, if we reject our ancestors, we're saying, I reject this body. I reject, like I wanna be really sex positive and embrace my queer self and everything. And yet I reject this body. Uh, I reject my blood and bones and who I am. Well, that sets up a tension. That sets up a a self-defeating. It it can play into self-hatred and shame and a sense of just being kind of a loser ancestrally. And it's important to not stop there. Don't 
one of the biggest gifts we can give to our ancestors in terms of their reciprocity and taking care of them is to expand our perception of what's meant by ancestors to include the older indigenous animistic tribal pre-colonialist ancestors and how we experience them to not let the recent centuries of misery and oppression define entirely who we are and that is a relief for us it's a relief for the older ones because they get to have a voice and it's actually good medicine for the ones who did live in a harmful way during life because they start to experience the blessings of the older ones lifting them up the dead can change the harmful out of line ancestors that are parts of our lineages can change and I would personally say it's part of our moral or ethical responsibility once we see the situation to participate in cleaning that up so that those problematic energies don't recreate themselves. So if everyone really tended to their own blood lineage ancestors as a foundation for cultural healing, things would move along a lot quicker. And when a person is moved, let's say, to participate in healing for those who have died from HIV, it's my bias that being excellent with your own blood ancestors creates a foundation from which to mo more safely enter into that collective grief and pain. Because if you're tending to the ancestors of others, when you have not yet considered your own ancestors, your own ancestors might um, act to block or disrupt that. Or they might be like, really? Like you're going to tend to others dead, but not yet consider your own body and bones and so there's a you know in my bias there's an etiquette that you want to at least be in some kind of relationship with your own ancestors otherwise we can run from the cultural trouble that we're downstream from but we have so much leverage with the cultural trouble that's in our own blood and bones and so to get well with our own ancestors is a body level healing which is very connected to sexual wellness you have created a body of work that is very methodical uh, and clearly delineated of a process of how to work with older ancestors for um, personal healing, for lineage healing, and for cultural healing. And I know that you have a book coming out next month and just wanted to give a plug for your book. Great. Which I'm super excited to to have in my hands. Uh, it's Ancestral Medicine, Rituals for Personal and Family Healing. Just um, wanting to know if there's anything you would like to say about that and where can we get a copy of it? And just like any, but it's published through Inner Traditions, so you could find it on Amazon or Barnes & Noble or anything like that. And the book is full of exercises on how to actually do this work. I intentionally gave away the method, so I hope that goes well and i <laughs> like have fun with it and i am excited about training others in how to guide this work and hope that people really actively culturally appropriate what i've done and eat it up and make it their own and use it to address the massive amount of disturbance and trauma and crisis in the collective psyche of humanity right now there's not time to be too picky about it so i gave i gave it away and having said that i am training others in how to guide the work in a in a grounded way and so if folks are drawn to assist others in getting well with their ancestors as part of your vocation or calling in some form that's quite possible the need is so great that there's a lot of folks who are coming into that awareness and so if people have that calling, act on it. Know that it's it's good. There are people who can help with it. Great, thank you. And I imagine that there is information on Daniel's website, ancestralmedicine.org, where you can find out everything that you would need to know about how to participate in Daniel's workshops, trainings, um, get a copy of the book, or this practitioner training that he's also leading. Daniel, I just want to thank you so much um, for your time here, but also for the work that you're doing um, in tending to these wounds of culture. Uh, it has been such a blessing in my life personally to be in contact with you and learn from you. And I know what a blessing it is for so many of us. So thank you. And thank you for taking the time to be here. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah. Thank you so much, Bhavani. Yeah. It's good. Yeah. Wonderful. So thank you all for listening to this episode of Bespoken Bones, and we will see you at the next episode. Mm-hmm.